أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعين ونستهدي ونستغفر ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد قال الله تعالى في قرآن الحكيم بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون صدق الله المولانا العظيم ورفعنا بالقرآن الحكيم وصلى الله على سيدنا وحبيبنا مولانا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا السلام عليكم my dear beloved brothers and sisters جمعة مباركة to all of you we begin as we begin all of our affairs as believers by recalling and remembering the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for indeed he is the one and the indivisible he is the one who has taken upon himself the most beautiful of names, Asma'ul Husna, and has made chief among those names his qualities of mercy and compassion, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim. He is the most generous one, Ya Kareem. He is the all-loving one, Ya Wadud. He is the most subtle in his kindness, Ya Ra'uf. And he is the most just, Ya Al-Adl, but whose justice is not removed from any of those other qualities. And therefore, my brothers and sisters, on this auspicious occasion of Yom al Jum'ah, the day of gathering, we renew our testimony of faith deep within our hearts and upon our tongues and through our limbs, that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. He is the one, the true, the real, the sovereign over all affairs. And it is from him we come and it is unto him that we return. And we bear witness likewise with the same conviction, my brothers and sisters, that out of Allah Ta'ala's loving mercy toward humanity, he sent us prophets and messengers in the form of guides to teach us how to live according to the way of Sirat al-Mustaqim, the straight way. And so we send our peace and our blessings upon all those prophets and messengers. And we send our choices, peace and blessings upon our beloved, the chosen one, Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and upon his family and upon his companions and all those who follow till the end of time. My brothers and sisters, it is such a joy to be together in this virtual reality and to remember the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to remember that which the Quran would call us to remember. And today I want to focus on the reality of Jannah. I want us to focus on the reality of Jannah. And I want to say, as the Prophet Wasallam would say, Al-Jannah to Al-Haq, that paradise is a reality. That paradise is a reality. That paradise is a reality. And the reason that I say this, and the reason that the Prophet Wasallam would say this, is because there's a fear that what people do not see, they stop believing in. And in reality, paradise is something that may not be seen with the naked eye while we are in the existence of the earthly realm, but it is something that can be understood in the logical mind. And it is something that is clearly articulated in the worldview of the Quran. And it is a belief that is within the hearts. And this is a belief that we must affirm and reaffirm and affirm and reaffirm because we are living in an age, my brothers and sisters, especially in the West, in which there is the prominence of atheism and there is the prominence of materialism. And these philosophies lead us not only to disbelief in the existence of God, but they also lead us to disbelief in the existence of the ba'ath, and the, the existence of the hereafter. And what's very interesting, my brothers and sisters, is that even more than the existence of God being denied in the modern world, what we find is the existence of the hereafter and the reality of paradise and hellfire and the day of judgment being denied consistently, even among the people who claim to be of the Abrahamic faiths 
in which there is clear articulation of the judgment and there is clear articulation of eternal paradise and damnation of the hellfire. In fact, there are articles and essays that are consistently being written, especially coming from the Christian world, in which there is an attack upon a belief in the hereafter, a belief in hellfire and a belief in paradise. And my brothers and sisters, it's very important for us in this day and in this age, which we are a part of, to affirm the things that are part of the unseen, that are articulated very clearly in the Quran as being part of the unseen. Because if you look at the Quranic narrative, you will find that in Surah Al-Baqarah, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alif la mim dhalik al kitabu la rayba fi hudallil muttaqeen, that this is the book in which there is no doubt and it is a guidance for the people of God consciousness. And then it goes on to describe who the people of God consciousness are. And the first description that comes up is that those who believe in the ghaib, those who believe in the unseen. And this is what distinguishes a believer from a disbeliever. A believer does not just believe in the material world. A believer does not just believe in what they can see with their naked eyes or smell with their nose or hear with their ears, but they believe in that which impacts the heart, that which appeals to the logical mind, and that which is told to us through the revelation of the prophets. That we believe that we are stuck in the womb of the earth. And while we are stuck in the womb of the earth, we have a very limited worldview as to what exists beyond this earth what exists beyond this world. Whereas we know now, even through physics, that there are these parallel universes that exist out there. And it is similar, my brothers and sisters, to being stuck in the womb of our mothers. That when we're in the womb of our mothers, it's a particularly uh, dark reality. Uh, you don't see too much. There is a very limited experience of what the world is and what reality is. And if when we are in the wombs of our mother, somebody were to come to us and say to us that soon you will exit this realm and you will enter into a whole new world that's known as Hayatul Dunya, the life of this world. And in the life of this world, you will see much joy and you will see much suffering. You will see trees and you will see oceans and you will see flowers and you will see human beings who are fully functioning and walking and talking. And you will see much in the form of uh, hardship and trials and tribulations, we would probably say that you are just pulling our leg. We would probably deny that reality because it's so hard to imagine for the fetus that is in the womb of the mother that there could be a reality beyond this reality. But surely enough, soon we do exit and we do come into this Hayatul Dunya and we start to experience all that is around us. And similarly, my brothers and sisters, when we are in the womb of the earth, the prophets come to us, having seen what is beyond the earth. And they come to us and they say, prepare yourselves for exiting the womb of the earth. Because when you exit the womb of the earth, you will experience these different things that are known as the day of judgment, that are known as paradise, and that are known as hellfire. And it is often our inclination to disbelieve in the prophets, to call the prophets crazy, and to think of ourselves as sane. That people who describe a world beyond this world are people who are considered to be insane, people who are considered to have lost it. Whereas we think of ourselves as totally stable and totally normal and, to and, and totally sane. But the reality is quite the opposite, that the prophets have looked beyond the window of this world and they see what is to come and they start to inform and give glad tidings and also to give warnings. And those who follow these prophets, who come with signs, who come with proofs, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in particular coming with the sign and the proof of the Quran, the greatest miracle that lives on with us 1400 years later, that it is the wise who follow these prophets. It is the wise who understand what they are saying. It is the wise who pay adherence to their words and to their guidance and to their glad tidings and as well as to their warnings. And so one of the key features of the Qur'an, my brothers and sisters, and this is unique to the Qur'an among world scriptures, is that it is very vivid about its descriptions of the day of judgment. That this is a day in which there will be a lot of turbulence, 
This is a day in which everything will be turned upside down. This is a day in which the camels will uh, release their uh, children from their wombs because of, their, of them being terrified. And the mothers will do the same everywhere in all species. That this is a day of great horror, of, of great trial and tribulation, of great fear and anxiety. And this is described very vividly in the Quran. And then what happens after the judgment day, that there is the eternal home of paradise. And paradise is described so vividly as a place of great pleasure, a place of great joy, a place of great peace and of great comfort, how we will enter it and what we will experience in it. And the crisis and the absolute horrors of the hellfire are also described to us very vividly. And one of the reasons why this is a hallmark of the Qur'an is because the Qur'an is the final revelation to humanity. And in this final revelation to humanity, God is trying to tell us, be prepared for the judgment day and be prepared for what is to come after that. And how to prepare us for this is by giving us very vivid descriptions of what these things are. So that we don't think that our leg is just being pulled, but rather we understand that these things are true that these things are reality, so that the Prophet ﷺ would say, يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةُ الْحَقِّ That the Day of Judgment is the truth. That النَّارُ الْحَقِّ That the hellfire, is that it is the truth. And that الْجَنَّةُ الْحَقِّ That the paradise, that it is true. That we have to believe in these things as being true. Because this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls us to believe in, in the Qur'an. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the unseen, these are all matters of the unseen but we must believe in them as if they are seen. That this is the nature of the people of confidence and conviction, that they make the unseen as if it were seen through their faith and through the prism of a pure heart. The more pure our hearts are, the more that we are able to see beyond the material world so that the human being is limited with corrupt hearts, but the human being has an incredible possession of creativity and imagination and being able to, to dream beyond the realities of this earth with a pure heart. And if there is any doubt about the fact that there is alternative existence, that there is an existence beyond this existence, that there are parallel universes in which things look very different, then let us consider our dreams. That every single night when we go to sleep, the Prophet ﷺ said, that death is like the little sister of, that, that sleep rather, is the little sister of death. So every single night we experience a mini death. We experience the death before death is to come. And what we experience in this mini death that we call sleep is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes possession of our souls and that our souls travel through the cosmos and that our souls see things that are fantastical and that our souls see things that are beyond the reality of this world. And dreams are a clear indication every single night from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we should prepare ourselves for a world that is yet to come. And so my brothers and sisters, we might ask ourselves at this moment, why is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the eternal damnation of the hellfire and the eternal place of joy which is known as the garden of paradise, Jannah. And perhaps the reason for this is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is truly the most just. And any just system has a clear set of rewards for those who act virtuously and for those who act correctly and for those even who act heroically. And there is a clear sense and a clear consequence of punishment for those who act corruptly, for those who act with, without regard for God and for the well-being of other people, for those who commit sins and for those who commit crimes. And this is part of any just system, that there is a set of rewards and that there is a set of punishments. And so this is the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala
to the existence of a hereafter is because they say that they say that moderns are often opposed uh, to, uh, to, to, to notions of the hereafter because they don't understand how this could be part of the justice of God. They will say, for example, that if a person commits finite sins, then how is it that they would experience eternal damnation? This doesn't seem to be consistent with the justice of God. And in fact, some of the scholars of Islam agreed with this philosophical opinion, and they therefore saw verses in the Quran that indicated to them that the hellfire will not be eternal in a way for every single person, but rather many people will come out of the hellfire and that they will come into the realm of paradise, or at least they'll enter into a place that is between hellfire and paradise. So these are some of the philosophical arguments that people presented. But one of the things that we have to think critically about is that the people who say that there is no such thing as a hereafter, right? They are in fact uh, the ones who are uh, diminishing the justice of God. Because if one is to say that the tyrant who kills children and the child who dies at the hand of a tyrant, both, both experience the same reality upon death, which is non-existence, then that is truly unfair. Then that is truly unjust. Then that truly doesn't make sense in terms of a divinely ordered universe. It only makes sense that those who commit crimes, those who are not held accountable in this life, that those who commit major sins, that those who deny altogether the generosity of God and don't want anything to do with God, that there is a place for them. And that those who want God and desire God and act virtuously and righteously and act heroically, that there is a place for them, that this is part of the justice of God. But also my brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who creates us and the one who forms us and the one who knows our constitution the best, not only our physical constitution, but also our spiritual and our psychological constitution. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best that the basic psychology of the human being is that we are motivated by reward and punishment. Again, oftentimes today we would like to believe that we are beyond that, that we're so sophisticated that we don't care about reward and punishment. We just do things for the sake of virtue, that we don't care about punishment, we don't care about reward. But basic human psychology 101 is that we are driven by profits and we are driven by loss. If you are to speak as a capitalist, for example, you are driven by profit and you're driven by loss. That you act in certain ways in order to profit and you avoid certain actions in order to avoid loss. So similarly, the spiritual aspirant, similarly, the person of virtue needs that motivation as well. And oftentimes we quote, for example, uh, the great sage of our tradition, Sayyida Sheikha Rabi al Adawiyah, who was walking through the streets of Baghdad one day with a torch in one hand and with a bucket of water in the other hand. And when people said, Ya Sheikha, where are you going? She said, I am going to light fire to paradise and I'm going to extinguish hellfire with the water so that people worship God for the sake of God and they do not worship God for the sake of reward and punishment. And Sheikha Rabi al Adawiyah was onto something. She understood that the most important thing that leads us to God is sincerity. And this is what she was trying to teach the people. But when we quote this tradition, what we forget is that she also understood that we are motivated by reward and punishment because the greatest reward for the human being, the greatest reward for the spiritual aspirant, the greatest reward for those who know truth as truth is closeness to God, is closeness to God. Being close to God is the greatest reward. It is the greatest pleasure. It is the greatest contentment and source of happiness. And being distant from God, being away from God, being cut off from God, that this is the most miserable thing 
that the human being can experience. It is the most anguish filling thing that the human being can experience. And this is a state that we seek God's protection from. So a Muslim may read the Quran and the vivid descriptions of paradise and hellfire and say, ah, this is all a metaphor for closeness to God or distance from God. And you can come to that conclusion if you will. But don't forget that the descriptions are there for a reason. And it's not only there to pull our leg. It's not only there to delude us, but rather it is there as a reality of something that exists. It is a reality. It is not just an illusion. It is not just a metaphor. It is not just a similitude. And so my brothers and sisters, one of the things that we can do for our spiritual souls and for our virtuous souls is that we should take in the descriptions of paradise in particular. And when we find it hard to act virtuously, when we find it hard, for example, to forgive someone who has offended us, when we find it hard to give charity when our own money may be diminishing, when we find it hard to struggle in the path of Allah when there are so many other temptations that are around us, when we find virtue to be hard, one of the best things that we can do is that we can close our eyes and we can imagine one of these vivid descriptions through the Quran and through the sayings of the Prophet Sallallahu And we can daydream about a reality that will exist beyond this life and that we can inspire ourselves toward that act of virtue that may be missing within us. That we may be able to refrain ourselves from acting sinfully and acting angrily and acting with hatred and resentment and jealousy when we are able to understand the reality of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised through the garden. I personally love to imagine the river of Kawthar that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is promised in the shortest surah of the Quran, inna a'tayna kal Kawthar, that we have granted you the Kawthar. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he asked his companions, do you know what al Kawthar is? And the companions, they replied that Allah and his messenger know best. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went on to describe al Kawthar in many different ahadith. He said that it is a particular gift that is granted to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in which there is much goodness. That Kawthar comes from Kathir, which means much. And then when you add the wow and it becomes Kawthar from Kathir, then it is an abundancy of goodness. It's an abundancy of goodness. It's an overflowing goodness. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that we have already granted to you this overflowing abundance. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that it is a river that all the believers will be invited to drink from on the day of resurrection. There is the hawb which the believers will gather around with the Prophet sallallahu before they cross the sirat, the bridge. And that hawb is like a pond. And the source of water for that pond is the river of Gothar from Jannah. And then in Jannah itself is the river of Gothar that exists. And the Prophet sallallahu said its banks are made of gold. Its bed and its rocks are made of pearls and rubies. He said that the mud of the river is like the scent of musk. That when you smell the river, it is like overflowing musk. He says that it is a river whose substance is whiter than milk and sweeter than honey. He says that in it are birds whose necks are as long as the necks of camels. He says that it is the distance of one whole month in its length and in its width. And he says that its drinking vessels are made of gold and silver and that they are more plentiful than the, scar than the stars in the sky. And he says that whoever drinks from it will never experience thirst again. Allahu Akbar. So if you take a description like the river of Gotham and you imagine being with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and you imagine being with the fellow believers, including those who we love in this world. 
and you imagine drinking from that river and that you imagine being there in that moment, that that should motivate me and should motivate us to act righteously, to act virtuously, to act heroically if needed, to act with great deeds of goodness, of charity, to just sacrifice our egos in order to get there, to be there. And this is what it requires. It requires the sacrifice of the ego. Because in that same surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَصَلِّ بِرَبِّكَ وَنْحَرْ So we have granted you, not just the Prophet ﷺ, but the ummah of believers. We have granted you this river uh, in paradise that is known as al kawtha So what should we do in response to that? As an act of gratitude and also as a way of getting to that river to direct our prayers to our Lord and our sacrifices. قُلْ إِنَّ صَلَاتِي وَنُسُكِي وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَمَاتِي لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Say that I devote all of my prayers and all of my sacrifices and I devote my life and even my death to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That we should be willingly sacrificing our lower desires and our egos, our anger and our jealousy and our stupidities and our foolishness and our wrong actions, our lust and all of those things in order to be people of great virtue and in order to make it to the river of Gotha on the day of resurrection and in, and in the hereafter in the day of in the days that the believers look forward to as being the best. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, my brothers and sisters, tells us the truth when he tells us the descriptions of al kawtha And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says about the rewards of paradise, and in this, in these rewards, let the aspirant place his aspirations. Let the aspirant place his aspirations, right? That we are, by our very nature as human beings, people who aspire to things. Let us aspire to the rewards of paradise. And the greatest reward of paradise, of course, my brothers and sisters, is the beatific vision. To gaze upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with contentment forever and ever. And to have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gaze upon our humble souls with contentment forever and ever. That that is truly the greatest gift that the believers are promised in the highest realms of paradise. So let us ask for that. Let us pray for that. Let us work for that. Let us be motivated for that. Let us sacrifice for that. Let us struggle for that. Let us be people of Jannah before we get to Jannah. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us all of those virtues that we know the people of Jannah possess. Allahumma ja'alna min ash-shakirin wa ja'alna min as-sabirin. Oh Allah, make us among the thankful ones and among the patient ones. Allahumma ja'alna min al-muttaqeen wa ja'alna min al-qanitin. O Allah, make us among the God-conscious ones and those who obey you. O Allah, make us from among dhakirin Allah kathira, among those who remember you much and often. Allahumma ja'alna min al-awliya Allahi la khawfun alayhim wa la hum yahzanun. O Allah, make us among your friends upon whom there is no fear, nor shall we grieve. These are the prayers that we should be making if we understand the reality of paradise and if we understand what lies waiting for the righteous and if we understand the limited reality of this dunya, which is so short and so pale in comparison to the awesomeness and to the beauty and to the eternality of paradise, the home from where we once came, the home that we seek to return to. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant it to us and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us each other's company in it. Fakhru dawana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa salatu wa salam ala ashrafil anbiya'i wal mursaleen ala sayyidina wa habibina maulana muhammad 
wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathiran kathira walhamdulillahi rabbil alamin amin bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahimin and now i read it leave it to my beloved sister our beloved sister firdaus idris who will lead us in dua inshallah Assalamualaikum everyone. Um, all praises to Allah, the Most High, who, bes- who besides him should we glorify. We bear witness that there is no other deity worthy of worship but Allah, our Lord, the creator and sustainer of all things, the majestic and most honorable, the one who arranges everything in detail, esteemed and measured perfectly, the one who from his mercy has guided us, and we send our peace and blessings to the Prophet Muhammad, the seal of the prophets. O oh Allah, we ask you to forgive all our sins, the major ones and the minor ones, the first ones and the last ones, the ones we committed knowingly and unknowingly. Our Lord, you are the most forgiving and you love to forgive, so forgive us. O oh Allah, we ask that you not leave us with a burden without lifting it and grief without relieving it, and are sick without curing them. There is no power or strength except in you, O Allah. O Allah, our helper when all doors are closed and our only hope when all hope is gone, we ask that you protect our hearts from deviating or entering despair, because with you there is no despair. O Allah, we ask you for protection from all the bad, evil, and harm in the world, because without your protection there is no protection. O oh Allah, we ask you to protect those who are e- experiencing exploitation, oppression, and violence, that you grant victory to our allies who are fighting for their basic rights to live. O oh Allah, make us amongst those who enjoin good and forbid evil. We ask you to make the truth evident to us and establish justice for those who have been wronged in both this world and the next. O oh Allah, grant us the courage and resolve necessary to stand firm for those who cannot stand for themselves the weak, the hungry, the sick, the poor. O oh Allah, you love sincere, sincere persistence. Grant us sincerity in our resolve to do better and the conviction to persist when we are tired and weak. When it feels like we have not seen change, in those moments, remind us that it is only through your will that anything occurs. La hawla wa la quwata illa billah. O oh Allah, remind us that we are responsible for our efforts, not the end result. O oh Allah, grant us the ability to sincerely reflect on how we benefit from or contribute to systems of oppression and to do the work of, uh, to do the difficult work of reflecting on how our thoughts, biases, intentional and unintentional actions may harm or hurt our brothers and sisters and grant us the conviction to challenge ourselves to do better. O oh Allah, we ask that you make us amongst those who heart, whose hearts are continually connected to you. Our Lord, we ask you to make our hearts firm in remembrance of you. O oh Allah, we ask you to make us amongst those who have the best of character. We ask you to make us gentle when we are harsh. We ask you to make us strong when we are weak. And we ask you to grant us, gener- uh, make us generous when we are miserly. Let our character be a testament of our faith, O oh Allah. Let our character be the proof of our Iman. Let our character be the gateway of our da'wah. O oh Allah, we ask you to protect us from arrogance and racism, shaitan's main downfall. We ask you to make us of those who are humble to you. O oh Allah, we ask you to grant all the good the prophets and messengers asked before us and seek your protection from all they sought protection from. And we ask that you send our peace and blessings to the Prophet Muhammad and his family, as well as the prophets before him. And we bear witness that there is no other deity worthy of worship but you.